This is Communion Sunday, and for those of us who are from Catholic background, it's the same as the Mass, the Lord's Supper. And you're all welcome to take part in it this morning. But there are some things you need to be clear about in order to take communion for your good and not for your harm. And I'd point you to one of those if you'll open the Bible at 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 27. 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 27. It's page 999 in that Revised Standard Version, 999. And 1 Corinthians 11 and 27. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of profaning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a man examine himself, and so eat of the bread, and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment upon himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we should not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are chastened so that we may not be condemned along with the world." So even if you've read that for the first time, you can gather that you need to examine yourself before you take the bread and wine this morning. And you need to be able to discern the body of Jesus. You need to know what this sacrament is about. And we, of course, in our modern society, cleanse everything, sterilize everything, and make everything nicey-nicey, so that often it loses its real point and power in our lives. And there is a real danger of us doing this with communion, because so many of us, not only of Catholic background, but of Protestant background, have been taking communion for years. So, loved ones, I'd just like to make it clear again to all of us what communion means. The first thing it means is in connection with a piece of the Old Testament back in Leviticus, if you'd look at it. It's Leviticus, and it's chapter 20 and verse 9, and it concerns your relationship with your mom and dad. Leviticus 20 and verse 9. It's page 102, 102. Leviticus 20 and verse 9. For everyone who curses his father or his mother shall be put to death. So that was the law. If you cursed your mum or your dad, you'd be put to death. So I'd ask you, have you ever cursed your mother or your father? Or have you ever had that attitude to them, whether you cursed them or not? Now, you deserve death. Look at verse 10. If a man commits adultery with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress shall be put to death. Have you ever committed adultery? Have you ever had intercourse with somebody who was married to someone else. Well, then you deserve to be killed, to be put to death. Look at verse 27 at the end of that chapter. A man or a woman who is a medium or a wizard shall be put to death. So have you ever been involved in spiritualism? then you deserve to be killed. Now, loved ones, that's what God's law says, that you should die for any sin that you've committed. So, it goes for stealing, and it goes for bearing false witness, and it goes 
for lying and for coveting, the sinful soul will die. We should be dead now. You see, that's it. That's the law of God. Now, this communion this morning states God's mercy to you and me. It states that Jesus died the death for you. And that's why you're not dead yet. That's why you weren't struck dead. That's why you weren't stoned to death like the man you remember in the reading that Gentry uh, gave us this morning, the man that was gathering sticks on the Sabbath. He was stoned to death. Now, the reason you and I have not been killed on the spot the first moment we lied, the first moment we coveted, the first moment we had thoughts of fornication, the reason is that this dear Son of God died for you. He died the death that you should have died. And it's because of that that God shows His mercy to you and me this morning. That's stated in Psalm 103. Psalm 103. It's page 522, Psalm 103, and verse 11. Five hundred and twenty-two, and Psalm 103 and verse 11. Look at 10 first. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor requite us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is His steadfast love toward those who fear Him. So the first meaning of communion is that God does not deal with you in this life according to your sins or reward you according to your iniquities. He deals with you graciously, mercifully. Therefore, loved ones, you and I have to deal that way with each other. You remember there's a piece in the Bible that says, God cannot forgive you if you do not forgive others. So we live now because of a gracious God who has given us that sky out there. We don't deserve to be able to see that sky. We deserve to be dead. But God has allowed you and me to live out of grace and mercy and forgiveness. So must we deal with each other that way. So must we forgive each other. So must we be merciful to each other. I'm with any of you here who says, but if I'm a boss, don't I have to demand discipline from my employees? Yes, yes. The whole world would fall apart if we didn't demand justice and order. But in our heart's attitude to each other, there is to be absolute mercy and forgiveness, unending, because we ourselves are the recipients of such unending mercy and forgiveness. So, brothers and sisters, first of all, communion states that you and I are all alive today because of God's mercy, and therefore we can only live one way with each other. So, loved ones, there's no place for resentment against roommates. There's no place for a critical attitude towards husband or wife. There's no place for holding grievance against your friend or your colleague. We have no ground to stand on for that. We are in days of grace. We live because of God's mercy and because of His forgiveness. The first thing you need to do, therefore, to take communion this morning is to get rid of any judging of somebody else, any criticism, any resentment against somebody else, any demanding that somebody else live up to your fine standard because you have failed utterly to live up to the standard of your Creator. So the first meaning of communion is God's mercy towards us. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor reward us according to our iniquities. Now the next step we take in the 20th century is the trap into which many of us have fallen and is the reason why many of us live such futile lives. Here it is. 
if God has given Jesus to die for my past sins, then all He requires of me now is to do my best, and Jesus' death will make up for the shortfall. That, I think, is the gospel, as almost all of the 20th century understands it. If God has forgiven me for my past sins because of Jesus' death, then from now on I've just to do my best, and God will make up for the shortfall. It results in a world full of people who do not exercise their wills, who do not live according to God's plan, and who have long ago lost any spiritual relationship with God. Because, loved ones, that is not the gospel. God's mercy covers past sins. It does not permit continual sinning with the understanding that the blood of Jesus will make up the shortfall. It doesn't. There is a notice, typically polite, in a famous London store. In fact, it's Harrods. And Harrods have several nice restaurants. And in one of them, they have on the wall, please try to stop smoking. And another one, please try not to smoke. And uh, my wife and I joke because we can imagine some guy puffing away saying, I'm really trying, I'm really trying. <laughs> because that kind of direction gets no results. But that often is what you and I understand to be the gospel. God has forgiven us for our past sins because of Jesus' blood, so all He expects us is to do our best, and wherever we fail, the blood of Jesus will make up the shortfall. Loved ones, that is not the gospel. The mercy of God does not wipe out our responsibility to avoid sin at all costs. The mercy of God does not permit sin. Now, you'll see that clearly in both the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. Look back at the Old Covenant, which is the piece we read in the lesson. It's Numbers 15 and verse 27. Numbers 15 and verse 27. It's page 129. And it's an important distinction about sin that we do not make in these days. It's what makes sense, of course, of Jesus' death and makes sense of all our dealings with God, but we have ignored it. Numbers 15 and verse 27. It's page 129. If one person sins unwittingly. He shall offer a female goat a year old for a sin offering. Another translation of that adverb is unconsciously or unknowingly. If a person sins unknowingly or unconsciously, if he sins he doesn't realize he's doing it, then he shall offer a female goat a year old for a sin offering. And the priest shall make atonement before the Lord for the person who commits an error. An error is sinning without knowing it, sinning unconsciously. When he sins unwittingly to make atonement for him, and he shall be forgiven. You shall have one law for him who does anything unwittingly, for him who is native among the people of Israel, and for the stranger who sojourns among them. The other case is entirely different, loved ones. In verse 30, but the person who does anything with a high hand, whether he is native or a sojourner, reviles the Lord, and that person shall be cut off from among his people. Because he has despised the word of the Lord and has broken his commandment, that person shall be utterly cut off. His iniquity shall be upon him. Do you see? If a person sins with a high hand, you can guess what that is. It's contrasted against unconscious sin. 
It's conscious sin. If a person consciously sins, he knows this is a sin, he knows it's something God despises, and yet he does it, and he continues to do it, then that person cannot be forgiven. That's what it says. That's even back in Old Testament days. Even in Old Testament days, there was no sacrifice that would cover conscious sin. There was sacrifice that would cover unknown, unconscious sin. You suddenly realized you'd done it, and you sued for forgiveness. But there was no sacrifice that would cover continued conscious sinning. Now, loved ones, it ties up with a doctrine that many of us knew from we were children from probably your first communion. And it's mentioned in 1 John 5 and verse 16. 1 John 5 and verse 16. It's page 1068. 1 John 5 and verse 16. Page 1068. If anyone sees his brother committing what is not a mortal sin, he will ask, and God will give him life for those whose sin is not mortal. There is sin which is mortal. I do not say that one is to pray for that. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is sin which is not mortal. In other words, the new covenant comes right down the same line. It says there is mercy and forgiveness for unconscious sin, for venal sin. There is not forgiveness or mercy for conscious mortal sin, where a person continues to do what they know is wrong and persists in it. Loved ones, we need to be clear. We do. Otherwise, you will take communion this morning and drink damnation unto your own soul. The death of Jesus is for all the sins that you commit probably day after day that you don't know about. Things that you do that you don't realize you're doing, you're sorry for them when they're brought to light, you confess them, and God forgives you and cleanses you from all unrighteousness, and you go on. Jesus' death is to cover those sins and to put them as far as the east is from the west. But, loved ones, it is not to provide for future sinning. Loved ones, don't you see yourself? It's madness. Don't you see yourself? It makes no sense. I mean, if what we're saying now is not the gospel, the other stuff is foolishness. The other stuff you know is foolishness. Nobody here on earth would think of dealing with you that way. Well, do your best. Do your best anyway. And whatever kind of a mess you end up at the end of this life, I'll haul you into heaven, and somehow or other we'll make it work. It doesn't make sense. You know it doesn't work. Mortal sin is conscious known disobedience to God's law. In other words, you can't take communion today and have in your heart a determination to continue doing what you know is wrong. See, that's it. That's it. I mean, you can, but there'll be no work done in your spirit, and there'll be no real relationship with God. You'll be a hypocrite just talking big but not living in the power of God's Spirit. Now, that runs through all of the Old Covenant and all of the New Covenant. Just look, loved ones, at Matthew chapter 17. <coughs> Matthew 5, I'm sorry. It's Matthew 5. Because I do think some of us are genuinely confused about this. And I think it's good to clarify it. Matthew 5 and verse 17. Because I know what's in our hearts, you know, but Jesus, Jesus, I mean, He's forgiveness and mercy. But here are the Lord's own words. 838 is the page, and it's Matthew 5 and 17. Think not 
that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have come not to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, it's like an apostrophe, you know, not an iota, not a dot, not a period, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Whoever then relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But he who does them and teaches them shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Doesn't mean he'll be in the kingdom of heaven, the man who's called least. He'll be called least in the kingdom of heaven. He who does them and teaches them shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. You have heard that it was said to the men of old, you shall not kill, and whoever kills shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother shall be liable to the council, and whoever says you fool shall be liable to the hell of fire. So if you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Make friends quickly with your accuser. And then in verse 27, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. And I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and throw it away. It is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. Loved ones, that's serious stuff. You know that. It's our own Savior telling us that His death cannot cover persistent known sin in our lives. That we have to forsake. And if you say, well, what's the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant? The Old Covenant gave no power to overcome sin. The New Covenant has brought about our death in Jesus and our recreation in Him with a new personality and with the gift of the Holy Spirit so that we are able to obey from our hearts. That's the New Covenant. The Old Covenant gave a command, but no power to fulfill it. The New Covenant gives the command, but gives a new heart and a new personality to us and a new Holy Spirit today. The Holy Spirit is new and will come into your heart this morning and will enable you to obey from the inside of your heart out to the outermost part of your body. That's God's promise. That's what the New Covenant is about. The New Covenant is not a softer gospel. The new covenant is a power gospel. It's the gift of power to live up to what we were called to obey in the old covenant. And of course, loved ones, it's built into the old covenant. If you look back at that Psalm 103, that high point in the Old Testament where really the psalmist is touching the fringe of the New Testament, Psalm 103, and verse 13. Indeed, if you look at the verses that we read before, you'll see it. In verse 10, you remember, of Psalm 103. It's page 522, 522. Psalm 103 and 10. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor requite us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward anybody no, toward those who fear him. Those who fear him. Those who fear to hurt him with their sin. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities everybody? No. So the Lord pities those who fear him. So, loved ones, it's built into the old covenant too. God extends his mercy to all of us this morning who believe that Jesus has died for us and to all of us who are determined to forsake all known sin in our lives and to live obedient to his commandments from this day forth. And to those of us, he gives a new heart. He gives a new personality. 
And he gives the Holy Spirit to give us strength and ability to live above sin during these coming weeks and these coming months. Loved ones, that's the gospel. So will you consider your life now before coming to this holy table? Especially, can I say to those of you who are like so many of us, you have doubtful things in your life. You have some things you're not sure of. Remember your own past life. Remember the tendency of us human beings to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. If there's doubt, you can bet the thing's wrong. You can bet you're not being too hard on yourself. And it won't kill you to forsake whatever it is. So particularly, if you have some things in your life that you have been debating back and forward on, those are the things that have been making you sick spiritually. Those are the things that have been destroying your life with God. Have done with them. Finish with them today. Determine, I will no more indulge in that sin. Whatever is not a faith is sin. If you have something that you're doubtful about, you haven't faith. So that's sin. So if you have something that you have any doubt about, then you certainly haven't faith about it. So it's sin. So have done with it. Don't touch it. Leave the unclean thing at the altar today and go out of here determined to live obedient to every command of God that you know of in this dear book and that He has given to you through His Spirit. And if you do that, God will give you His Spirit's power to obey. And then, if you find yourself falling, and you find you've fallen, immediately you become conscious of it. Sue for forgiveness before God. Commit yourself again to walk absolutely obedient. You see what it is? It's not a fiddler on a roof. It's not. It's not a salvation that you're going to lose if you make an unconscious step in the wrong direction. But it is a salvation that depends on an honest heart that fully intends to obey God. That's it. So you know yourselves. No one knows you besides God. You know yourselves. Examine to see if there is any intention in your heart to continue in any known sin and have done with that this morning, loved ones, and walk out of here with a clear, clean determination and intention to obey God in every detail you know, realizing that the blood of Jesus will cover unconscious, unwitting sin. And God will regard that as far as the east is from the west, so he will remove that far from you. But he does demand that you have a full-hearted intention to obey him. So, will you seriously deal with this? Because this is the basis of God's forgiveness for us this morning, and it is for you. Let us all stand as we receive the invitation.